Hello there everyone and welcome back to the 17th Star channel. I'm Overlord Jeebus and I'm going to be doing my first impressions of Oathbringer today. So when I picked up Oathbringer I took a week off of work to read it and then once I was done because I'm a slow reader and I took the whole week to read it I wrote this as kind of my first impressions kind of review so this isn't really you know a proper review review because you know I am a Brandon Sanderson fan you are on the 17th Shard channel Full disclosure, my views are going to be a bit more positive than you'd be expecting. So this is more, the things that I wrote down were more the things that immediately jumped out as me as things I really liked and things I didn't like because I there are some things I didn't like even though overall in my opinion of this book is that it is very, very good. So this video is going to be split into two parts. The first part is where I'm going to be completely non-spoilery where I'm just going to be talking about what I, what I feel about the book and is basically going to be a little bit of a review. And then the second part will be the spoilery section where I do go into more detail about things I did like and did not like. So, non-spoilery review. If you liked Way of Kings and Word of Radiance, you are going to love this book. All the stuff that you love from those books is back in this book. We've got cool action sequences, we've got some tragic deaths, we've got some cool uses of magic systems, we've got the characters that haven't met before, meeting for the first time, having cool interactions between them, and there were some of those that I really did like. The arcs of almost every single character in this book are all about people accepting their mistakes and their failures as part of them. We, you're probably very aware that all the characters have made mistakes in their past. You know, we had Shalan confronting hers in the first book, Kaladin, you know, trying not to repeat his, and this book seems to be where they have kind of have to accept yourself as a culmination of all of your successes as well as your failures. Journey before destination after all. And it's, it's a fantastic story that is that is extremely good. It hits the highs definitely beyond to the highs that Words of Radiance and Way of Kings hit. The, the lower parts are definitely some of the lowest and the darkest that Brandon Sanderson's ever got. So this is probably easily one of his best books, and I know quite a few people have said it is their favourites already. Pretty much every review of Oathbringer that I've read has included the phrase somewhere, this is Dalinar's book, and they are not wrong. We learn a lot about the Blackthorn in this book, and he was a scary guy. More than anyone, he embodies this theme of accepting your mistakes. His flashbacks are heartbreaking, his quest to unite Roshar is gripping, this is Dalinar at his best and at his worst, and it is brilliant. And finally, this is definitely the longest Stormlight Archive book we've had to date, in fact it's probably the longest Cosmere book we've had to date. Part 3 feels like a whole novel within itself, so make sure you've got time to commit because oh boy, this thing is a beast. And that's going to be the end of my non-spoilery segment, so, so if you're on the fence about whether to get it or not, or when to pick it up, I would definitely recommend this one. And I would also recommend turning this video off now because I will be spoiling stuff that happens near the end as well as, you know, pretty much the whole book. I'm going to be talking a lot about the rest of the book. So three, two, one, spoiler time. This book is honestly one of my favourite that I've read from Brandon. The amount of Shadesmar stuff we get in this book I absolutely adored. I was so happy that we kind of got to see a little bit about how their cities works, a little bit how, you know, the Sea of Beads and the, the tendrils of how rivers work and all that kind of thing, and the, the lighthouse sequence was great. You know, at one point I had wondered about how we're going to get a whole ten books from this series, you know, another seven to go, and it made me realise, you know, during that short part four, that we basically have a whole other planet to explore on Roshar. I really enjoyed Shalan's journey all throughout this book, her mind basically breaking into pieces and her kind of having to pick up those pieces and they are ending up kind of as separate entities at this point, but subservient to Shalan is a nice way of tying that off because I did get very, very worried about her quite a few moments during this book. I really hope this girl gets better <laughs> in the future because she is not well right now. Kaladin's story was also good, even though I did feel like he took a back seat in this book, which I don't have an issue with. He's probably the least interesting of all the protagonists, in my opinion. You know, as much as I like him in Syl, not a huge amount story-wise happens around them. You know, Shalan's got her fingers in a lot of Roshar and secret stuff, Dalin eyes, you know, got the thing. Kaladin's just kind of a guy, just, you know, his struggle with how the morals of the Oaths work together and, you know, the way that that's going to play off the secret of the Recreants I'm really looking forward to seeing. I do think he's going to be hit really hard by that. And his fourth ideal plotline has my theory nerves tingling and I can't wait to jump into that in the future. Speaking of Kaladin, I really liked Syl in this book and one thing that I really really enjoyed which I was really hoping we'd see in this book was Syl and Patton interacting and then when part four we did get to see a good amount of that and it was really good and I, I did enjoy their interactions. The whole Colin family was very well done. Navani was great. I'm really looking forward to seeing her airships being built. Yasna was fantastic, even though I wish we had more of her point of views because we just need more of those. They were great. I'm so happy that she's queen now. I feel like that is going to be fantastic. I can't wait to see more of that. Adolin's arc was also very good, even if it was a bit not what I was expecting. I thought that the Sadius murder thing was going to play more into his character than it did. 
and so that, that left me a little bit iffy, but overall, he's just a very likeable guy, and his bluntness and honesty in certain conversations I really liked. He's never going to be one of these characters that hide something from someone to be revealed in the future. He's just going to straight up tell everyone. Here, <laughs> that's really appreciated. Renarin didn't get as much screen time as I thought he would, but I do understand that he was trying to save that until after the Gliss reveal happened, and I definitely was not expecting that Gliss reveal. That is very interesting to me. When we did get his point of view, I really, really came to like him, and him in the last battle is just great. And finally, Dalinar's storyline, and I had to put the book down several times after reading some of these chapters. The first one being when the rift happened and when that was burnt. That whole flashback of, you know, as he puts it, the march, the lonely march back and then the flames. I just, from the arrival at Rathalas to its complete and utter devastation, this is definitely some of Brandon's best writing. I also had to put the book down when Rhaenyra brought him a bottle of wine when he was just in a drunken stupor on the ground. I, I, had to, I just had to put the book down. I have to say something about Elokar, just because him in this book was just... Oh boy. In part one, I was just thinking, this isn't going to go well, his trip to Colonar. And then, you know, he's really looking up to Kaladin. And then that moment at the end of part three, with storming Moash, I'm just like... That has to be, I've never been so angry at a book before, <laughs> at a moment, that moment right there was so good and so heartbreaking, I loved it, it was fantastic. All in all, the main cast of characters got some great arcs and some great storylines, but now I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that I liked less. Firstly, I felt that part two and three definitely dragged. They definitely didn't need to be as long as they were, Especially part two, I thought, was actually dragged down by some, some of the Bridge Four point of views, not all of them. Whilst I loved Relaines and Rox specifically, others I felt didn't contribute as much. Tef's I felt could have been an interlude. Uh, Scar's was just, to me, I just didn't care about Scar or Lynn or that entire chapter. I was just like, whatever. And I also can't tell who I hate more, Moash or his chapters. Every time I turned the page and I saw that, you know, torn bridge four coat, I just was like, oh, not another one. I really didn't enjoy them. So whilst there is some really strong characterization for the, through these bridge four points of views, some of them were definitely better than others. Though at the end of part two, when Odium turns up, I was stunned. I was completely taken aback. I was not expecting that to happen. And that basically redeemed all of part two for me was just that ending part where it was all building to that. Part three felt like Brandon taking another stab at this kind of city under siege storyline that we saw in Well of Ascension. I did think this one dragged a lot in the middle. I do think if, if it wasn't for Hoyd and Vivenna, I feel like I would have been pretty bored during these chapters. I was very surprised at how much of a role Hoyd played in part three. And the, this isn't an analysis video, so I, can't, I don't want to get into it just yet, but he do dropped some spicy little tidbits in there, which I really, really liked. And Vivenna. Oh, Vivenna. I knew that when she turned up, she was going to be really obvious. And I'll have to shout out to Yata for pointing her out to me, because I initially didn't suspect her, and it wasn't until he pointed out that, well, I think before her first appearance, he was like, I think Azur might be Vivenna. And I was like, nah, there's no chance. But then as soon as she said her first little colour metaphor, I was like, yeah, there's, there's definitely her. I was also surprised at how large her role was in this book. She stuck around for basically a whole part and a half. And the only thing that really bothered me about her was that the characters weren't constantly asking her questions because she pretty much revealed, yeah, I'm from another planet. I'm, you know, this shard blade? Yeah, it's not actually a shard blade. It's something, you know, something different. Uh, you know, I've got like the ability to make ropes come alive and all this kind of thing. And no, no one really questioned her, even though, you know, we had three of the characters trapped on a boat with her for several well, weeks, I think it is actually in the book. Now on to a few of my biggest problems, and these are all in part five, because that was freshest in my mind when I wrote this script. I didn't like how Ash and Talm just turned up in the final battle and then immediately disappeared with no explanation. They're literally there just for Dalinar to go, oh, hey, look, heralds, and then they stormed off. And I'm like, well, what was the point in that? Like, it really did feel, it just felt pointless to me. My second major issue was with Zeth's choice to join Dalinar. He basically has absolutely no reason to do this whatsoever. I really was, I was quite enjoying his chapters up until this moment, but his reasons for joining Dalinar, are just, just, they just don't exist. They're never stated in the book whatsoever. We, we have a word of Brandon from the Oathbringer tour about why he did it, but the actual reason for him to do it is just not, it just doesn't exist in the book. He's only met Dalinar twice, both times he was trying to kill him, 
he's only ever had one on-screen conversation about Dalinar, and that was with Taravangian telling him to kill him. From what we, from what I was reading it, and what I knew of Zeth, it seemed like that, firstly, the Skybreakers hadn't even had any idea about what was going on in Neurothero. And so he doesn't, I don't, he's not even aware he's a bondsmith. It's like, that, like, Zeth just saw this guy with a book on the battlefield and was like, yeah, that guy, I recognize him. I'm just going to follow that guy. And it just, it didn't feel earned at all. And it was just a really big hole that I couldn't stop thinking of whenever it was a Zeth point of view. I'm just like, why are you doing this? You're, he had absolutely no motivation in any of the scenes put after that decision. And I just, it really just stuck out to me. I'm also not a big fan of Venli becoming a Radiant. I'm just not a big fan of Venli overall. I felt like she was a good villain, and I felt like I liked her as a villain who, after they got what they wanted, realized that, oh man, it maybe actually sucked a bit more. But I just don't feel like she's broken enough to become a Radiant. I don't think she's suffered at all. You know, she's basically the reason that all of this is happening. She's, it's her fault. And she basically gets away scot-free, where she, all she has to do is, oh, tell a little bit of a dramatized version of what actually happened. And then now she gets superpowers. Because she, she just regretted it a little bit. And it's like, oh yeah, when you cause the apocalypse, but then you don't get to be in charge of the apocalypse, yeah, sure, you get to join the good guys now. And I'm like, it just didn't, it really didn't set well with me. And I didn't, I didn't like that at all. This isn't as big a mistake as the Renarin reveal as a Radiant in Words of Radiance. But I still think it was a big one. Plus, I just really liked a show now and didn't want her to die. So, a few last notes. Lopin's final oath really made me laugh. I really enjoyed that. That final battle really shows why you shouldn't split your plate and your blades, Rithalans. So hopefully they won't make that mistake in the future. Lift, Zeth, and Nightblood were a fantastic trio, and I hope we get to see more of them in the future. And I'm sad that we didn't get to see Erythero activated in this book, but, you know, it gives us something to look forward to in the future. So I'm going to end this video on my looking back on the predictions I made during my walking to Erythero videos that you'll be able to find in the description. Firstly, Dalinar as the author of Oathbringer. I was rather annoyed at how pointless the part one epigraphs were, but when we found out that Dalinar wrote this and by his own hand, it really enjoyed that. I thought that moment was good, and on my reread that I've already started, reading these epigraphs now, I am like, there is an emotional aspect to them now, and so I do appreciate them a lot more. I felt like they existed purely for rereads. Second, that Dalinar will kill Evie. This one I saw coming from a mile off. I've, I've assumed that Dalinar killed Evie from, like, my first read of Words of Radiance. The way it played out, though, that's not what I was expecting. I was still pretty surprised by that gut-wrenching moment. Third, Dalinar will do something horrible before the end of this book. Dalinar became this close to becoming Odeon's champion. Like, this close. I mean, the whole ending hinged upon him having that choice. Kind of a choice. The whole ending hinged on him having that choice and him saying no. So I'm going to give myself a leer, like a half tick, just because I feel like I was close enough. Fourth, Irithyria will not survive until the end of Oathbringer. I was very wrong on this one, but it was close due to that final attack. It was attacked mostly by almost completely unawares, but if it wasn't for our favourite moss head theft, then it would have fallen, but it didn't, so I'll accept I was wrong about this one. Fifth, we will find out the secret of the recreants in this book. Whilst I was a little underwhelmed by this reveal, just because it is actually information that we already knew, I am surprised at how it kind of, they kind of recontextualize it to make you think, huh, we have already knew that, but that's kind of a bigger deal than we first thought. So anyway, thank you. That's the end of my first impressions. And as I said, some of the problems I had have been addressed outside of the book, but in terms of my actual first experience reading the book, they were still issues present. Hope you guys enjoyed. Leave a comment down below. You can chat to me on the Discord on 17th Shard, on the Reddit, and uh, I'll see you guys next time where I am going to be taking my first look into Oathbringers and the interludes for part one. See you next time. Bye!